So today I'm going to talk about React, uh, which is a, a JavaScript library that I work on. And we announced uh, the open sourcing at JSConf US in May, and we got some sarcastic reactions to it. Uh, th this tweet was, was not a compliment. Um, so we basically challenged some kind of conventional wisdom with React. So um, as we talk about it, I'd appreciate it if you gave it five minutes. We've used this for a lot of big applications on big teams, and it's worked really well for us. So I'm going to focus not on kind of teaching you how to use React and build applications with it, because you can go online and look at our tutorials and our videos. Um, I'm going to instead focus on the design decisions behind um, what we did, why we did that. Um, and you know, even if you don't use React, maybe you can, can take those decisions and apply them to your own projects. So React, we call it a library for creating user interfaces. Um, to get more specific, that means that we render your UI and we respond to, to events in the browser. You can think of it as the V in MVC. You might want to think of it as the controller as well, depending on your definition of MVC. But there's a big focus on playing nicely with your stack, whatever it is. So a lot of the early React success stories were existing projects that dropped it in on a small part of their app, and they started using it for more and more of their application as time went on. So we're going to talk about a couple things today. The first is that I'm going to um, focus on some prerequisites. So we like to combine the DOM generation and display logic rather than using a templating system. And a lot of people don't agree with that. And I wanted to explain why we think that that's a great idea. Then I'm going to go into React's design. So what makes building applications with React really, really fun and easy? And um, the, the core idea there is we basically re-render the app every time the data changes. And finally, what a lot of people are really interested in is our unique implementation. So we've built this JavaScript library from the ground up using a lot of different ideas um, than other libraries. So I'd like to talk about that too. So let's dive into the first thing, which is building components and not templates. So I'm sure everyone here has built a UI with JavaScript before, right? Everyone? Um, has anybody used a, a client-side templating library like Handlebars is a really high quality one. Um, a lot of people use them on the server as well. Um, so cynically, we like to think of, of components as mixing markup and display logic. Uh, but we do like separation of concerns, right? That's the, kind of the number one reason for using a template. So a templating language basically takes in a data structure um, and combines it with an HTML document marked up with some special directives and spits out some static markup. Um, but separation of concerns um, really isn't a specific term, right? Like, what are concerns? They're, it's very ill-defined. So I'd like to kind of zoom in on this definition and talk about coupling and cohesion. So these are terms from software engineering. Uh, and we're talking about reducing coupling and increasing cohesion. So coupling is the degree to which each module in a program relies on the other modules in a program. So um, think about the really annoying bugs or features that you had to build in your day-to-day -day, like work. Usually the ones that are cons um, constrained to a single function are pretty easy to deal with, right? You go in, you isolate where the problem is, you fix that function or that class, and you move on with your life. Maybe add a unit test too to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, the really painful bugs and features are the ones that um, you have to make changes to multiple modules. So we like to call these cascading changes, and they're a symptom of um, tight coupling. So kind of the way I think of coupling is that if I want to make a change to some piece of functionality, do I have to make a change to this module, and does it affect all the other modules requiring me to make changes to them? And that's what makes software really hard to maintain. Um, another term that we like to think about is cohesion. So cohesion is the degree to which elements of a module belong together. So you can have the most decoupled architecture um, ever, but if those modules don't really make sense in terms of the functionality that they contain, um, it's also not going to be maintainable because it's going to be hard for you to figure out um, you know, where to make the change because those concerns are kind of spread all over your program. So uh, 
I think that templates encourage a really poor separation of concerns. And it's not just templates, it's anything that really tries to mark up an HTML document and you know, make it alive and, and really make it interactive. Um, so AngularJS style directives also fall into this category. Um, and why would I say that? Because obviously when you create a template and you have your display logic in one file and your markup in another file, that seems like a reasonable separation of concerns, right? When I want to change the way that the application behaves, I go to the JavaScript file with the display logic. And when I want to change the way that it looks, I go into the template and change the template, right? Um, it's actually kind of a misunderstanding because there is an implicit coupling between that display logic and the template. So the template's always going to need to read some data from JavaScript, right? JavaScript fetches from the server, tells the template what to do, and then the template renders it. However, imagine that I wanted to implement a zebra striped table. So it's a data table with alternating row colors. Um, with a template, um, a lot of times you have to pass along that um, row color in your view model, which is the piece of data that your, your controller or your display logic passes to your template. Now, if you want to change the way that that template renders, you can't actually only change the template anymore because you have to make sure that the data in your view model is synced between the template and the display logic. Um, so we actually like to think of display logic and markup as inevitably tightly coupled because you basically need to update the DOM somehow. And you need to, to somehow couple the state of the DOM with your display logic. Uh, but the good news is, is that they're actually highly cohesive because they're doing the same thing, right? So think about what your template does. Your template generates HTML. The browser parses the HTML um, into DOM nodes. Then your display logic just manipulates DOM nodes. So they're doing basically the same thing. They're both rendering the UI um, to DOM data structures. So what we're actually doing when we're using templates and display logic and separating those out, we're separating technologies, not concerns. Um, and the problem with this is that the technologies um, that we're, we're separating are deliberately underpowered. So I'm going to pick on handlebars for a second, which is an extremely popular um, open source JavaScript templating solution. And it's a great one. It's really fast. It solves a lot of people's use cases. But it falls into the, the common trap of templates, um, which is you rely on primitive abstractions. Um, so for example, if you want to reuse a template, um, the kind of standard way to do it in handlebars is to use something called a partial. And a partial is a, is a mini template that you can include in other templates. So think of if you wanted a profile pick component on a social network. Um, and you reuse it all over the place. You would use a partial to implement that. Now the problem is, you're basically copying and pasting in uh, this partial into a template, and it gets all of the variables that the parent has in the, in the current scope. This is a whole bunch of implicit dependencies now. So because the, the child template or the partial may be reading from any one of these variables, you have to go track down every single call site that the partial is being used in order to make sure um, that it's you know, being updated correctly when you want to make a change to the partial. And another symptom is relying on kind of flow control abstractions like each. So um, each basically iterates through each item of a sequence and emits some markup in a traditional templating language. What if you want to kind of change the way that you iterate over the list? Or what if you want to insert two pieces of markup um, where the templating language only thought you would want to do um, one per list item? It's, it's just difficult to deal with because you don't have the power of a full programming language. You have a, the power of a template language, which is deliberately underpowered. So there are some other symptoms um, of this. I talked about um, marking up an HTML document with directives to bring it to life. Now, in order to do that, you're basically trying to create a, a new way to express program semantics in a document. So you're kind of like creating a new programming language. Now the problem with this is that the way that, that people are building these abstractions on the web today, they don't accept that they're building a new programming language. So you have to invent a lot of new concepts that are slightly incompatible with you know, a real programming language that we have today, JavaScript. So um, Angular is hugely popular these days, so I obviously have to pick on them. And I've, I've pulled this out of the Angular directives docs which is the way that you mark up a, an HTML document 
um, and you know, connect it with the JavaScript part of Angular. And I've highlighted all of the new concepts that they had to create that are already in JavaScript and that you have to learn. So there's a lot there. And the point of all this is that a lot of the ways that we build applications today, the, the frameworks and libraries we, we use um, try to tell you how to separate your concerns for you. Um, but we don't think that the framework can do that. Like, your application, you don't think of your application in terms of models, views, and controllers. You think of your application in terms of user profiles and navigation bars and, um, you know, posts on a timeline or something like that. So we think that the framework of the library you're using um, should just give you tools for you to express your program in the language of your problem domain um, rather than the language of the framework itself. So the tool that we came up with was a React component. And it's a highly cohesive building block um, for building UIs and, that is loosely coupled with other components. And so with React, even though we're combining the DOM generation part of your UI and the display logic that drives it, we can actually separate our concerns in a, a way that matches your application better um, by using components with the full power of JavaScript rather than relying on a crippled templating language to do it for you. So here's a, a very, very um, quick example of, of some React code. Like I said, this isn't a tutorial. Um, I, we're not going to dive in too deep. But I just want to point out some things. With React, when you want to reuse some code and, you know, or handle an event or something like that, we don't create a new type of abstraction for you. You don't have to create a partial or something. You create a JavaScript function, and you call the function. And the best part about that is that you can then lint the function, or you can unit test the function, and you can take advantage of all of the great tooling that JavaScript has today. Another thing that's really important to note is composition. So one of the things that we identified building large apps early on is that composition is pretty much the most important thing when building applications. So being able to reuse components and build components out of other components. And finally, I've highlighted expressivity. So you can actually use regular JavaScript expressions inside of your display layer. Because sometimes you actually need the full power of JavaScript to do it. You shouldn't have to jump through hoops to add one to a zero index you know, a list item or something. Um, so anyway, the important takeaways are that components are reusable, and they're composable, and they're unit testable, because they're isolated units. So if you're used to building templates, and if you have a lot of experience on legacy, code, or legacy PHP code bases like I do, you're probably concerned about spaghetti code. So we're not advocating going back to the world where we call like MySQL fetch row in the middle of your data table rendering code. That's a terrible idea. Um, so my answer to kind of asking about spaghetti code when we combine DOM generation and display logic is just don't write spaghetti code. <laughs> Keep your components small and only put display logic in components. We're all you know, engineers here working on the web. And with great power comes great responsibility. No matter what framework, library, toolkit, or language you're using, you can write spaghetti code in it. Just take action to, to use good design principles and avoid it. Another thing you're, you might be concerned about is security, specifically cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. So one of the main advantages of templates early on was that you weren't generating markup and strings. And generating markup and strings is, is pretty dangerous because you might accidentally concatenate a user-provided variable. And that um, might contain you know, a script tag that then steals someone else's cookies and then can post on their behalf. It's pretty dangerous. So we're not building you know, strings of markup with React. We have a small library called React DOM that generates a representation of the DOM for you. So if I wanted to, to create a link, for example, I call React DOM A, which stands for an A tag for link. The first argument is equivalent to the HTML arguments or attributes. And you just pass it in as a regular JavaScript object. So right here, it's a link to my Instagram account. And then the second parameter is you know, an array or another a React component or a string that represents what should be contained within uh, this tag. And that 
library automatically escapes everything for you. So if you put you know, HTML in there, it'll be escaped. So we want to generate this DOM representation with a bunch of functions that look like uh, this, right? If you work with designers, and I've, I've worked with designers, they really don't want to do this. Um, they're, they get, they're really good at Photoshop and, and you know, working on HTML mockups, but they don't really want to maintain all of this code. At the same time, I don't want to spend four hours tweaking the box shadow of my, my components. I just want to get like 90% of the way there, then let the designer like pixel push. So working with designers is really important. So we built an optional syntax extension called JSX that lets you use an HTML-like syntax uh, with React. So one thing that's important to note is that this is completely optional, and you don't need to use this to use React. And the same is true the other way around. So JSX can be used outside of React if you want to. So what JSX will do is it'll take an expression like this, embed it in a regular JavaScript file, and it will translate it for you to this, the exact same code that I showed on the previous slide. And with JSX, we found that it's very easy for designers and people of all backgrounds to um, contribute code to React-based projects. So we like to think of it like this. The accessibility of templates and the power of JavaScript. You can go in and the code looks familiar, but you can use all the powerful JavaScript abstractions that you're used to. Do all the functional programming you want. All right. So I've talked about, have I convinced you guys that templates are a bad idea? I hope so. We're going to move on. So um, the next thing we're going to talk about is what makes React really cool and really interesting and really fun to use. And um, that's re-rendering the entire application on every update. So we built a lot of applications. And we identified that state is what makes building UIs particularly hard. So if you've worked on anything in the back end before, a lot of times you can kind of unit test your code, and it feels really solid, and then you ship it, and then the unit tests break, and that's a real failure. Um, but with UIs, there's a lot of variables and a lot of state and a lot of relying on, like, does this UI feel right, or does it look right? And this is, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on here. There's lots of UI elements. The, the fact that we are pushing to, you know, heterogeneous environments is, um, is also hard. Having a big mutable DOM that you have to keep track of is also very difficult. And there's user input that you might not expect, that kind of thing. In particular, data changing over time is the root of all evil. That's what we've identified anyway. Um, we're not the first people to come up with this, though. Some famous computer scientists agree. Dijkstra says, our intellectual powers are rather geared to master static relations, and our power to visualize processes evolving in time are relatively poorly developed. So what he's saying here is that we can understand how a single function works, right? We can look at the inputs, and we can look at the outputs, and we can figure it out. But when we call this function over time, and we set variables that might change in ways that we don't expect, it's very hard for us to keep that program in our head. So for that reason, we should do our utmost to shorten the conceptual gap between the static program and the dynamic process to make the correspondence between the program and the process as trivial as possible. What Dijkstra is saying here is make programs that execute over time, make them look like idempotent functions that execute at a single point in time. He's making an argument for functional reactive programming. So if we like, turn it back to 1999, when we were writing that PHP spaghetti code that executed on the server, everything was actually easier, right? If I wanted to submit um, you know, a new to-do item to my to-do list, I didn't have to keep track of every place where I put the, the number of to-do items in the list in my DOM and update each of those when it changed. I simply submitted to the server. The, so the server wrote it into the database, then selected all the information out of the database again and re-rendered the whole page. Conceptually, it's really simple to manage data changing over time, um, since you just re-render the entire page. And it's very easy to visualize that, because that process is a single point in time, rather than evolving over a point in time. So React borrows that. Um, so when your data changes, we re-render the entire component. We throw out your old um, representation. We call all your render methods again. And we have your new representation. Said another way, React components are just idempotent functions that describe your UI at any point in time, just like a server-rendered app. Um, and because of this, they're actually, you get this nice side effect of being really easy to unit test. You don't have to write code 
that you know, clicks on this, then clicks on that, and then updates this, and then asserting on the DOM. Because React just takes some inputs and provides some outputs, and the, the system handles the rest. So let me show you what I mean here. Here's another uh, little code sample. This is a clicker component, where basically all you do is when you click this link, um, it increments a count and displays the count. So the first thing that you, you want to keep in mind is that nowhere do we search for this DOM node and, and rewrite the count. We declaratively say, hey, this render method says what this component should look like. Um, and it doesn't say, here's the initial state and here's how to update that state. It's just render is called whenever the data changes. And we said that, that um, mutable state is, is the root of all evil, or data changing over time is the root of all evil. Um, but we do need mutable state in our applications. What React does is it isolates it as much as possible. So you can see right here, the only piece of mutable state we have is this thing called count, and the initial value is zero. It's very simple to read, and we've, we kind of highlight it um, in the way that we've designed the framework. Then, another important thing to know is not only what is the, the minimal representation of the state, but how does that state transition over time. And so all you do is search for the word set state, and you know all of the places where your state will transition. Um, we make this very, very explicit. Um, so when you go in and reread your code and try to find a bug, it's very clear all the places that you need to look. And so by re-rendering, you know, every time the data changes, it's very simple. You don't have to track down every single place where that count is rendered. Um, it's always guaranteed to be up to date. And we do it without setting up magical data binding. So nowhere did we set up a computed property. Nowhere did we you know, register things for change tracking or, or set up some sort of data binding. Um, we do it without expensive model dirty checking. We're just re-rendering. Um, and of course, no more explicit DOM operations. Everything is declarative. Everything is declarative. It seems like a pretty bad idea, right? because it seems really expensive to be calling these render methods over and over. And if we destroy the DOM every time the data changes, if you're in the middle of typing a comment, your text is going to be uh, lost, or your scroll position will be lost, or you're going to get that flash of unstyled content every time the data changes. And it's just going to be really um, not performant. Um, so we can't do this to the real browser DOM. We can't be re-rendering. So what we did is we built a virtual DOM, which makes re-rendering on every change really, really fast. I talked about a lot of reasons why we can't just do this re-rendering, but we can re-render to the virtual DOM. And it's optimized for memory footprint and, um, and just high performance. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, what happens behind the scenes when we do that update. So on every update, we generate a new virtual DOM subtree. This basically means that we call um, that render method again, and we take the, the return result, or the return value. Then we take the old return value, and we diff it with the new return value. Um, by doing that, we can compute the minimal set of DOM operations needed to bring the, the UI up to date. And then we put those into a queue. And then when the time is right, we batch execute all of that, the operations in the queue at once. If there's any game developers in the audience, um, you will understand that this is a lot like a game engine. So there's a great series of blog posts online about how the Doom 3 engine works. So at a very high level, um, you've got something called a world state, which is basically a series of, of, of user input events and um, the current state of the world. That gets dumped into the game logic fr or the front end of Doom 3, which basically says, here are the rules, here's how people move around in the environment, um, here's how doors work. Here's the, the set of weapons you can use. Then that generates something called a scene intermediate representation, which is a description of, of what the user should see. So the user should see um, you know, this enemy at this XYZ coordinate um, at this point in the map, and the, the door should be 50% of the way open. Then that goes to the back end of the rendering engine, which generates OpenGL operations and flushes those to the graphics card. Make sense? Here's React's architecture. Uh, we have application state and browser events. So that get initial state method, and then we have events coming in from the browser, you know, clicks or, or key presses or whatever. Then rather than game logic and, and you know, 3D um, levels, we have your React components that you've described. That's the business logic of your application. 
that renders to this virtual DOM. Then we do that diff on the back end, and we compute the minimal set of DOM operations, and then we flush that at the appropriate time to the browser rather than OpenGL operations to a graphics card. And this is actually really fast. And one of the reasons this is really fast is because JavaScript is extremely performant relative to the DOM. So every time you touch the DOM, um, with a few exceptions, um, you're paying you know, a pretty heavy price. So if you add a DOM node, you have to recalc the style. Um, and that can cause cascading changes. Um, so the fact that React computes minimal DOM operations um, really saves you a lot of performance. Now keep in mind that React is not magic and not a silver bullet here. So React will not suddenly make fundamentally slow operations faster. Um, this is kind of equivalent to, you know, you can always beat a C compiler if you write an assembler. But the fact is, is that you can write code with React, and out of the box, it'll be pretty performant. Um, and one of the real advantages here is that we batch read and writes for optimal DOM performance. So if you're doing manual DOM operations to really squeeze that last ounce of performance out of the DOM, um, it's very hard to do that at scale. And by scale, I mean for a big application worked on with lots of people. And the reason for that is that there's a phenomenon called layout thrashing. So I'm not sure if, if um, this is, th there's, there's a couple of great blog posts about this, but basically when you write to the DOM and then you read certain properties off of the DOM, so you measure the height of something, that forces the browser to basically update the DOM, compute where all of the, the rectangles are, and then return the measurements for you. And then if you write uh, to the DOM again, it may trigger an additional layout thrash. So if you're doing manual DOM operations, it's very hard for you to basically enforce that, hey, we should do all of our reads together globally, and then we should do all of our DOM writes together globally, and we should not thrash. But what React does is since React um, operates only on a virtual DOM, it can manage those reads and writes for you. So it basically optimizes globally for your application all of your reads and writes and batches them together. And because of this, um, we usually beat manual DOM operations. Um, and there's some other cool performance tricks in there as well. So if you're familiar with a technique called event delegation, um, it's a way to manage memory of event listeners. So imagine you have a big data table with a, a button on each, on each line. The naive way to, to listen to a click event on those buttons is to add an event listener for every button. However, you have to pay a little bit of a memory penalty for each event listener you add. So the high performance way to do it is to add a single click listener on the whole table, and then when that gets a click event, look at the event target and figure out which button was clicked. With React, we have a full virtual DOM and a full um, virtual event system. So we implemented bubbling and capturing ourselves in JavaScript. You can go see it on GitHub. And um, we do this top level event delegation for free. And because we have our own implementation of, of events, you actually get full W3C spec HTML5 events as far back as IE8, which is pretty cool. So let's say that React, React is pretty fast for most applications, um, but sometimes you really need to squeeze that last ounce of performance out. So we have some hooks for custom updates, where you can tell React, hey, um, this part of my application is going to be largely static, so don't even worry about managing it. Um, normally, for most applications, we don't need to use this. Um, but if you do, uh, it's usually, these methods are usually about one line of code, and they can get you know, a 10 times speed up, depending on, on what kind of um, application you're doing. But at the end of the day, we really, really value performance. And we look at performance in terms of dropped frames. So you can do all of this at 60 frames per second, um, even on a mobile device. And for us, you know, mobile is, is really where a lot of the growth is these days. And so if it doesn't work on mobile, then you know, it's not worth doing. So I'm going to show you a little video um, demonstrating React's performance. Um, this example is also on GitHub. What I'm going to show you is React doing this uh, virtual DOM diff and rendering and flushing every single request animation frame, which means that realistically it has to execute in under 10 milliseconds. I want to point out that there's not a single CSS animation or transition in this, and there's no overflow scrolling. So what React is doing is there's a great library called Zynga Scroller, which can interpret touch events and then give you the scroll position. And what Re React is doing is taking that scroll position, um, updating a state variable, and then doing that virtual DOM diff and rendering. So 
I don't really use PowerPoint that much, but I hope it works. Um, so this is a, a left nav. Remember, there's no um, CSS animations. We're actually animating uh, two content areas, one that's, that's blurred and one that is not blurred to simulate a frosted glass overlay effect. And we're doing um, kind of some 3D transforms there. Um, but we're writing it all in a, de a very declarative style. So it's not like, oh, this interaction needs to be high performance so we can't use um, you know, our reactive data flow. The point is that while you can do this in, in any library, you usually have to step outside of the, the reactive flow or the data binding system. But with React, um, this is the level of performance we really strive for. Um, and it makes you know, creating these sorts of applications a lot easier because it's declar writing your code in a declarative style um, is just really nice. So there's some other fun things that we can do. Uh, we can run in Node.js. And this is actually really, really interesting, I think. So I think that the, the term that people are using now is called um, isomorphic JavaScript. But basically, there's a little bit of a problem when you do a lot of client-rendered UIs, that when Google hits your page, it doesn't really see any content. It just sees a mostly empty HTML page with some script tags in it. And then it ranks you really low on, your, on the search results. So what a lot of people are doing these days is basically if they see Googlebot, they'll render their page in something like PhantomJS, which is a headless version of WebKit. And then they'll send um, down an HTML document just to Google. The problem is you can't do that at scale. It costs a lot. It's it, just booting up a DOM for every web request is, is really expensive. Um, and you also kind of can't benefit from from sh giving that same experience to your end users. So if you were to send down a static HTML page to your end users, they could start interacting with your page immediately. And then when the JavaScript boots up, um, it would respond to interactions. And that's what, what React can do. So React can generate a static HTML file, send it down to the client. And then when you call that render component method, it'll look at the, mark, or it'll, it'll look at the DOM and say, hey, it looks like I rendered this on the server. I don't need to generate any DOM nodes. I just need to attach my event listeners and get started. So you get a really fast initial page, ex page load experience, which is great. We can do some other cool things, too. So since you're not rendering to a DOM, you're rendering to a virtual DOM. And the things that you're rendering um, are components that represent the language of your application. We can do some optimizations based on how your component structure is changing. So for example, if you click on a button that navigates you from, say, your timeline or newsfeed, or sorry, from your newsfeed um, to your profile page, we can say, look and say, hey, a high-level component type is changing. We should probably use a certain strategy for clearing out a, a large subtree of DOM and replace it with this other, other one. Um, and we get that rich information because you're building with components, not building with templates that are tied to the DOM. I mentioned this before um, when we were talking about modular components. But you get testability for free. What I mean by this is, since we don't depend on the DOM, you can simply fire up a React component and render it to a string with a certain set of properties, and then you know, write your assertions on that. You don't have to do like a Selenium or WebDriver um, kind of setup to get that, that rich testing. Because again, we're, we're very, very divorced from the browser. Um, my colleague, Sebastian, who's sitting over there, did some great work with building um, SVG, VML, and Canvas support for React as well. So um, like I said, we render to a virtual DOM, not a browser DOM. So we can have a new virtual DOM implementation that represents the Canvas rather than the DOM primitives. So you can use React to build not only the rich interactive UI of your web app, but also drive the same interactive charts or graphics that, you know, Maybe you're, you're a newspaper and you want to sh do a, visual, a data visualization or something. Um, just one paradigm works, works on multiple ways to render. Um, and I have an experimental branch that runs your whole application in a web worker. Again, virtual DOM and virtual event system means that we can swap out all of this stuff and run it in, in alien environments. So this, this branch was about 100 lines of code. And all that we had to do was basically serialize the browser events from the UI thread to the web worker, and then send the DOM operations from the, or a, or a description of the DOM operations from the web worker to the UI thread, and then update in the UI thread. Now, I'm not sure if this is a good idea, but it's interesting anyway. And um, 
it has the promise of maybe you know, reducing the amount of work on the UI thread and having more responsive browser interactions. All right, so let's review kind of what I've talked about. Build components, not templates. Re-render, don't mutate. The virtual DOM is simple and it's fast. And there's one other thing. So we announced um, that we were open sourcing React at JSConf US. And this is our first time at JSConf Asia, so we wanted to announce something here too. So we're going, we basically are on the verge of open sourcing our React dev tools, which lets you inspect this virtual DOM representation in the Chrome Web Inspector. And we'll be giving demos of this, you know, after, I guess after the talk or something. Just go find us. So here are the, the Chrome dev tools that you know and love. And if we zoom in on the bottom here, you see some markup, and it's, it's a little bit unwieldy. So when you switch to the React tab, now we see the language of our application here. So as a, as a developer, I can go in and say, oh, you know, there's my image block layout, or there's my story. And then if I were to change um, that property on the right-hand side, viewer has liked from false to true, that little heart would show up on the, um, on the UI indicating that I liked it. And my name would also be added to the list of people that liked the photo because React guarantees that your app is consistent. So um, that's about all I have to say today. I really appreciate you guys having me, and I hope that this was, was helpful. Thanks. All right, so does anyone have any questions? Uh, hi. Um, hey. How does this compare to web components? Um, that's a great question. So web components is a, a big, constantly changing um, specification. And it's, there's, lo there's a lot to say about it. Um, one of the things that we focus on a lot is composability. So really, really deep um, building components out of other components. And I don't think that historically web components has been f uh, focusing on that aspect. Um, and there's a lot of nuance there. So data flow between um, you know, a parent component and a child component. Additionally, web components is a bunch of different technologies. Um, so shadow DOM is one big part of web components. And that's a, that's a really interesting, important part of, of kind of pushing the web forward. And that's something that we could take advantage of. Um, one kind of philosophical difference between web components and React is kind of how we perceive the DOM. So Web Components fully embraces the DOM and adds new APIs. React kind of hates the DOM and puts it away in its own little corner. And um, we only interact with it um, through message passing, basically. Um, and one kind of advantage of that is that we can do things like render on the server and get a faster initial page load experience. I don't think that Web Components has solved the problem of rendering on the server. Um, and basically doing a non-blocking like page experience. Is there any way of doing transitions between um, renders? Um, so like CSS animations? Yeah, any kind of transition. So we have um, a component called React Transition Group, actually, that will look at kind of how its children are changing. So if you add a list item, for example, um, you can implement a custom transition behavior. So the default one that we have behaves a lot like um, an animation library for Angular called ng-animate. So it will add CSS classes for you. So it makes it kind of trivial to add um, kind of fade-in behaviors and that kind of thing. Um, you can override that behavior and, and have custom transitions between DOM states if you'd like, though. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you have non-React code running on the page, like you have a jQuery plugin that goes and adds a class to a DOM element directly. Um, and then a React thing re-renders. How does it figure out, or does it figure out uh, that it should leave that class there, or does it say, oh, the diff is that class was removed? Um, this is a great question. So React kind of from day one had to interoperate with, with legacy code. So we have a, a set of lifecycle hooks that basically, you know, they look a little bit like the Objective-C Cocoa API. So um, we have component did mount and component will unmount which basically tells, um, they fire when the component is initialized on the page and there's a DOM node available, and they fire when it's about to be destroyed. So what you can do is in, um, you render a div, for example, as a React component, and then in component did mount, you boot up your jQuery plugin. Um, and then we have another hook that says component did update, which means there's new data available. 
So then you can bridge from the React, um, the new data that React has gotten, and tell jQuery, hey, the data has changed. And then in component will unmount, you just destroy your, your, um, your jQuery plugin. Um, maybe this seems like a really oh, obvious question, right. but if this um, renders really fast on mobile, does that mean it's going to be uh, find its way into a new like reborn Facebook hybrid application? And um, I don't work on the, the Facebook mobile site team, so I, I don't know what their roadmap is. Um, it, it's used all over Instagram.com, though, like the web properties. Thank you, Pete. Cool. Big Thanks. hands for Pete, please.